AI's potential to transform industries is perhaps the most clearly seen in the manufacturing sector. That's where we see the highest rates of adoption, especially in the US, the world's dominant AI market. But how are businesses and industries elsewhere in the world taking on this new tech? Well, to shed some light on the ongoing AI industrial transformation, we're joined by Chris Kong, general partner of PaperJet Ventures, and Daniel Yu, co-founder and CEO of Taiwan-based MetAI, both joining us from the Bay Area in the US. Um, Chris, I'm gonna start with you. Overhauling manufacturing on a, on a wide scale is easier said than done, obviously. Um, so what are some of the operational challenges of, of implementing new tech like industrial AI? Definitely working with legacy system, right? Uh, some of the legacy system are very, they're not friendly, developer friendly, uh, they're hard to access in terms of getting the real world data that's kind of locked in silo. Um, and that's why I think the first part is probably finding the right builders to integrate to the system and try to unlock the potential and start building uh, intelligence layer on top of those software. But ideally, I would love to see a kind of you know new system that's a manufacturing end to end that can basically build from scratch, think from the first principle to truly unlock the potential of AI. Well, um, Daniel, staying on with challenges for a second, um, US tariffs. Um, how are Taiwan's um, small and medium-sized businesses navigating this added challenge, especially AI-powered businesses that kind of straddle Asia and North America, Asia including China? I, I think I think in Taiwan there are a lot of SMEs, right? I, I actually come from an SME family business. Uh, my family business is about uh, is on traditional manufacturing, and I think uh, tariffs hit uh, uh, it hurts these SMEs a lot because they need to start thinking about uh, big decisions such as relocating, such as automations, such as di diversifying customer bases or the customer um, whereabouts uh, where where they get the revenue, right? But I think I think there's there's a very interesting thing happening in Taiwan, which is due to the fact that these, either the, the, those be SMEs or large corporations, they started to realize that they couldn't just do these things manually or, or the way that they did previously. So they started to look for other opportunities in the technology world, uh, which is also why I believe from my perspective, which is also why that we're seeing a growing um, openness to, of tools such as simulations, such as industrial AI planning, such uh, even digital twin technologies, uh, they kind of want to test out like what are the options out there for them to adopt in the real world. Yeah. Well, uh, let's stay with the challenges for a bit more and talk about one of the probably the biggest one, which is money, because perhaps the biggest hurdle to implementing AI is finding a way to pay for it. Uh, companies, after all, have to be ready and willing to invest. In the US, an overwhelming majority, 96% of manufacturers, have plans to increase investment in AI by 2030. What stands out in particular is that one out of five intend to invest at least 50% more in the next five years. Um, so Chris, um, I mean, cost usually the first factor that businesses look at when try to implement new technologies and, and processes. So how should they navigate the available options when it comes to AI these days? I would say um, in terms of uh, if you look at the operation, right, there's definitely a lot of opportunity. Manufacturing depends on which segment that you're targeting. It, it could be a low margin business, right? But to be able to use AI, where you can kind of reduce that design to production time, you can really save a lot of money. Uh, plus, one of the best part about using AI is that, that reinforced learning and giving the opportunity to sort of get a better feedback loop uh, and also like troubleshoot any kind of uh, issues with production early on before you actually go into full scale uh, production. So from a business point of view, it kind of really makes sense in terms of ROI to be able to start investing into AI and integrate them to their operation. Well, we mentioned this before uh, a little bit, but but I'm, I'm curious to know more. Um, in Taiwan and, well, in China for that matter, um, you know, manufacturers have been accruing experience over decades in, in precision industries and, and other industries, um, while elsewhere in the world, it has sort of fallen by the wayside. Um, 
in favor of services, for example. Um, so is, is that expertise in traditional manufacturing a boon or a hurdle uh, when it comes to you know, implementing AI? Um, Daniel, what do you think? So I think uh, for large corporations, because uh, they, they have more revenue, they have more margin. So they can basically think about the possibilities that industri industrial AI can bring to the table to them. They can test out, they can validate different solutions. Uh, so which is also why like uh, Med AI originally wanted to start uh, to help SMEs, help traditional manufacturing in a way that they would be able to adopt AI. But we realized that uh, if we start with SMEs, it's not that possible because all SMEs have different has different problems. So we need to standardize how industrial AI can be developed in a way that we can eventually help more and more SMEs or traditional manufacturing in the long run. So we started to work with larger corporations in the manufacturing field to standardize how we simulate, how we train these AI in this AI playground to, to, to bring the solution to the table. Yeah. So um, Chris, uh, what do you think? Who has the, a, a leg up in this uh, you know, traditional uh, manufacturers transitioning and adopting AI or uh, you know, more AI native startup trying to get into that space? Um, I would say personally in my mind, traditional uh, manufacturing has you know, a lot of legacy system, a lot of legacy ways of building things. Uh, I think for the short term to be able to integrate the operation, you probably can get some benefit and while remain uh, unhindered in terms of um, being and not, it wouldn't be any kind of hindrance in terms of, you know, uh, affecting their daily operation. But if I have to put my money, I would probably thinking about manufacturing. What's like the next generation of manufacturing? What does that look like, right? Um, some of the most exciting things that I've seen as an investor is this so-called factory of the future, fully autonomous system built from the ground up where it can run 24-7, where that the physical building, the hardware, the equipment, the software, all are integrated and robotics would be the centerpiece. And for me, that represents the, like the true vision within this end-to-end -end where you're able to design uh, and start you know, a manufacture uh, quality insurance and be able to kind of have this feedback uh, that kind of improve each time you do it. Uh, for me, that's the most exciting part. Oh, well, uh, so Daniel, your personal experience, you, your company MedAI has taken that leap and expanded into the U.S. market. How has it been so far? Good move? Yeah, good move. I, I think I think uh, from a scaling perspective, it's completely different from what we, we witnessed in Taiwan. I think uh, in Taiwan, while, while there are obviously a lot of manufacturers, uh, in Taiwan, they, they mostly chase for, for example, for end-to-end -end solutions that might, might prevent you from scaling because they, they want you to become a, a service-based company that basically provides services for them. And I think, I think that is very different from the ecosystem that I have with us in, in the US, which is uh, like all, all, these, all the people care about how you scale. They care about the vision. And if the vision is clear enough for them to get a glimpse of what, what value they can, uh, you can bring to the table, then they're always willing to do pilot runs. They're willing to, to, to even do proof of concept that, that pays uh, to, to, to test out your vision or your value. And I think that's a great move for us. All right, well, uh, before we close out, I, uh, let's take a sort of a bird's eye view of, of the uh, situation of this great transformation that many compare to the industrial revolution, you know, adopting AI in industries. Um, do you see it like that um, as a revolution or, or is it more of an incremental step uh, following, you know, automation, robotics, uh, stuff that we've seen over the decades? Chris, what do you think? I personally think it's exactly like the industrial revolution, right? We have the electricity era, we have the internet era, and I think AI will transform some of these industries. And right now it's the right timing Right. Between uh, demographic issues with aging population uh, and then we, we, we just lack the labor force. Uh, and also in terms of geopolitical and all the tailwind, a lot, in, a lot of kind of investment has coming in and putting attention into domestic manufacturing. So I think this is the right time right now. And the te technology is right there. So I think this is the right time where that, you know, industrial AI can truly transform and bring innovation into the sectors that are, have 
that a massive addressable market, but also lacks in terms of uh, innovation. And so that it can look exactly like what we have seen it, on the South by side. It, it does seem like a lot of factors are, are coming together, much like during the Industrial Revolution. Um, Daniel, what do you think? I, I think uh, the, physical, the physical and industrial AI world will be transformed in a way that is as huge as the Industrial Revolution, because the Industrial Revolution was about like replacing human with mechanicals, right? But right now, uh, this revolution that we're seeing is that it's not about replacing muscles anymore. It's about replacing the decision-making manually so that AI understands how they could help help support human in optimizing uh, workflows, optimizing production lines, and more. And I think that is a very massive leap. Uh, so I think the different, the biggest difference between this and the industrial revolution will, will be speed and scale. Because right now, uh, since the tech is kind of ready, uh, I don't think AI is spreading factory by factory. It actually can be spread so quickly across all the cloud infrastructure, all the simulation infrastructure, all these uh, across geographically um, uh, yeah, uh, spread uh, instantly. So that is also why I think we need simulations because uh, you, you cannot risk deploying poorly trained AI into the real world before you, you make sure it's safe, you make sure it is optimized in a way that it can support your business or your production line. And I think that will be what I envision the future will be.